Welcome to From Rome Info Video. My name is Brother Alexis Spagnolo, and this is the documentary on Pope Benedict's renunciation. Today is part two, and I'm going to discuss how we know if someone has renounced. Because uh, one of the fundamental problems uh, with, um, that surrounds the understanding of what Pope Benedict did on February 11th, 2013, is precisely that, understanding it. And here we encounter now the problems of uh, uh, modernity, modern errors, that prevent people from understanding. Um, part of the problem is public education no longer teaches um, the truth, but part of the problem is that society and culture teaches falsehood. And um, the first thing we have to understand is that we live in an age of sentimentality. People think a thing is true because they feel it, not because it is. Uh, people think that um, uh, just because he feels that way, he can express himself any way he likes, and that's fine, and everyone needs to accept it. That's not the Catholic view of the world, and that is not a sane or rational view of the world, because as we all know, uh, we are not dogs or cats who can only feel or remember. We are human beings who have an intellect and a will. We can know the truth. We can reason about the things we know. We can infer conclusions. And we can will this or that, or not will this and that. We're rational creatures. And uh, we uh, demonstrate that by the fact that we're the only species that has a language we can speak to one another and communicate what's in our minds uh, to with another and write it down and express it. So um, the first thing we have to recognize is that uh, in understanding a text, we can't appeal to the concept of sentimentality. The text does not mean what you want it to mean or what I want it to mean or what we feel it means or what Pope Benedict feels it means or what the Cardinals felt it meant or what they all uh, opine it to be okay so it has nothing to do with what we want okay once a text is written it means what it means okay it has, it's an objective expression uh, we're not dealing with uh, poetry that we can sit around all day in English class and discuss the possible illusions, references that the poet had in writing what he did because poets don't necessarily write anything certain. They write, try to write things beautiful and reminiscent in modern, in modern um, romanticism. And this is what sentimentality comes from. It comes from the romantic period where emotions were made to be the substance of art. Uh, Pope Benedict's declaration of February 11th, 2013 is a legal document. It is a historic document. It has um, a specific meaning. If it doesn't have a specific meaning, if it, mean, if it can mean one thing to you and one thing to me, if that's your position, then you've conceded that the he has not renounced the papacy because to renounce the papacy you have to clearly signify what you were doing and in other words renouncing the papacy and if you wrote something that is so unintelligible that anyone can read it any way they want then you have not um, duly manifested and we'll get to the reason why that has to be the case but common sense declares that um, the Pope is the visible head of the church on earth then how is there going to be unity in the church if people can't agree whether he's resigned or not? Okay, so it has to be absolutely clear. And you know, it's not difficult to make it clear. So sentimentality is one of the problems. The second modern era that involves it is modernism. Modernism is an era that thinks that there is no God, but everyone has some kind of religious practice because it wells up from the religious sense of their heart. And... Uh, your religion is just as equal as my religion, and we shouldn't debate about it because religion is not about truth. As you can see, that modernism is based on sentimentalism. It's just the theologic expression of it. it was one um, learned uh, 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 Englishman said that modernism is the refined atheism of the Anglican cleric. <laughs> uh, 
uh, because it appeals a lot to uh, corrupt ecclesiastics who want to appear to be religious but not actually believe in anything. So that's the second one, modernism. And, um, but there's also an ancient error involved and that is uh, called uh, uh, nominalism. Nominalism is a philosophic error that arose in the 11th century in France at the University of Paris and it was taught by Peter Abelard, who was otherwise a good philosopher, but um, in his um, ways of asking questions, but he was anomalous in the sense of he didn't believe that the word meant anything objective, that uh, the word apple and the thing that is an apple, he believed that there was no um, essential relationship between those two things. The word apple could be used to mean anything, okay? Um, nominalists are, aren't really saying what maybe an anthropologist would say, that words have values according to a cultural agreement in a society, and that is uh, handed down from generation. He's saying something uh, more than that, that this apple and that apple aren't really the same thing. They just are categorized by us. And from the era of nominalism, we will, you, uh, you will arrive through Kant's in, in uh, categories of thought where he felt that the fact that we call apple is something that's pre-programmed in our mind, and therefore it, apple does only exist in the mind, it doesn't exist in the world. And um, this error is very common in Germany. It was promoted at the University of Tübingen for centuries in the Middle Ages before Tübingen became a Protestant institution and when the Catholic faculties were established by the, um, the, um, the Protestant um, um, Duke of that region, uh, he, he got that he only chose the most liberal Catholics to found it and so they spread a lot of errors and Pope Benedict it was a professor at Tübingen. Okay, so uh, he was right in the heart of it, and um, if you read anything that Joseph Ratzinger ever wrote, you will see that all his thought is colored, or I say vitiated, is weakened by the air of no anomalism, because he spends all his writings talking about what the word could mean, or has meant, or does mean, in this and that author, and without any recognition that the, maybe the word has an objective, unchanging meaning, and that some people are using it incorrectly because they're ignorant, stupid, or just willful, willfully, you know, willful that they want it to mean something other than they do. Uh, if you had good schooling, then you know that you were taught that words have meanings and you must use them as you meant them. If you use them incorrectly, you were faulted, you lost some points on your papers, or your parents said, that's not what the word means. Look it up in the dictionary. I have to thank God that I had uh, two parents who were educators. And my mother always would say to me when I said, what does that word mean? She said, go look it up in the dictionary. And we had a big dictionary. It was like <coughs> that thick and that big, which for a kid was very difficult to open. But nevertheless, <coughs> that's the way to learn what words mean. And that is the adult, academic, reasonable sane and Catholic way to understand what words mean. So um, obviously if someone is immature, petulant, or has an agenda, that's not what he's going to do because he wants to bend words to his will rather than bend his understanding to what the words mean. And this is a fundamental problem in modern times, but it is, uh, it is a uh, it is not an error that comes technic it comes from the Christian faith. It comes from an attack or a denial of the Christian faith. Because once you accept the Catholic view that words mean have an objective unchanging meaning, then the gospel becomes uh, the Bible, the gospel, all the written texts written by Christian scholars and great saints, all become instruments for our sanctification, the glorification of God and the communication of his will. And the dark forces of this will, world hate God so much, they want to destroy those instruments of communication. So uh, modernism and nominalism and sentimentalism are, are you might say, uh, intellectually three heads of the beast. <laughs> you could name a lot more errors, but um, if you're infected by any of these, it's going to be very difficult for you to accept that Benedict's statement means something very specific and you can't change it. And, I can't change it, and everyone must accept what it says. 
uh, because uh, for you, truth is up for grabs and it can mean whatever you want. And therefore, we must answer the question politically. We must take a vote on what it means or something like that. Uh, at this point, um, if you're a Catholic that uh, recognizes that the ancient liturgy is the true one that comes from God and liturgies don't, aren't made up by committee, you can see the same error in the adjournamento because the previous liturgy was considered coming from God, inspired the Holy Spirit and something that you just don't change. Whereas the, the modernists think, oh no, we can, we can make up our own liturgy, let's have a vote, let's have a committee, let's impose it on people, let's tell them what it means, let's make it cozy, let's make it feel goody. And uh, so that's complete modernism, and that's um, why the, the vernacular liturgy uh, causes people to lose their faith, because faith requires the assent of the intellect. And if you're going to Mass every Sunday and there's, you're never acquired to assent, you're only acquired to feel, uh, you're not practicing faith, and faith not practiced is lost. And uh, not exercised, meaning it's, it won't be use, a useful tool to defend us from temptations of the forces of darkness, of which there are many. <coughs> so those are the three big errors that make it difficult to understand the problem and understand if someone has renounced. So now let me talk about um, the natural law. So when we talk about what a text means, we repeal the common sense. There's a certain... Uh, tradition and culture uh, in language of what words mean and um, that's something we're all taught to accept if, if you rebel about, against that that's I'm not gonna say it's perfectly fine you can write your own writings no one will understand what you're saying because you're no longer using language the way everyone else does or they might spend years and decades trying to figure out what you said so um, it is a necessity of life that we accept the culture of language and what it means Otherwise, we stop communicating with uh, the rest of society. It's kind of like it's the most antisocial thing you can do, but some people do do it. Um, uh, so, this commonsensical way of looking at language could be called the natural law of language. Okay, there's a necessity for me to communicate something to you. Therefore, we must use a verbal sign that we the meaning of which we both agree on precisely and exactly. Otherwise, we will not be able to transact whatever affair we have. Now, of course, if I'm just buying onions in the market, I can point to the onion and point to the money and, you know, say how much. That's a, not a very inaccurate, <laughs> inexact um, affair. We don't really need a precision of language. And here is where um, the problem with Pope Benedict's renunciation comes because Many modern countries are using modern languages. For example, in Italy, they use Italian. They no longer use Latin. And um, I have rarely met an Italian who knows his Latin, just like you rarely meet an English speaker who knows Latin. Um, modern Italian is actually the, the language of merchants at Siena, okay? And obviously, as I just pointed out, merchants don't use precision, and consequently, modern Italian is imprecise language. It only has 60 or 70,000 words, whereas English has 120 or 150,000. So it's a lot easier us for English to perhaps understand Latin because our language is more precise. Also because um, in many modern countries there have been revolutions that have attacked the language and prevent people from learning what it really is. For example, in France, you can't use the certain tenses, past tenses of verbs because that's considered aristocratic and it was abolished by the revolution. <laughs> and you can find uh, monks in monasteries that say only the Latin mass that will refuse to use those tenses because it's contrary to the revolution. And you open your eyes and saying, what, this is the last place I think I would have heard that statement. But it is said. We don't have that problem in English because the language was never attacked uh, for the sake of political reasons. Of course, I'm not saying that the British uh, all uh, use ter terms of philosophy or religion in the same way we Catholics do. Obviously, there is a difference between how pro what Protestants mean by salvation and what Catholics mean. But we have a, 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 a language, a common language. We can pick up a book written three centuries ago and pretty much understand what it is. An Italian would never be able to do that. And neither would a Frenchman. A Frenchman would have some difficulty. I, I tend to uh, hear from my Spanish friends that they don't have that problem in Spanish either. Spain, Spain has pretty much kept the tradition. 
So uh, these all make it difficult to understand what Benedict said because he said something in Latin. So now we have a professor from Tübingen who thinks in German, writing in Latin of a uh, declaration. Okay, so what does it mean? And so these are some of the preliminary uh, problems of understanding um, what it says. So let's get to the natural law now. Let's assume there was no church law that said anything about a pope renouncing, and therefore, whether the pope renounced was pure or not was purely a question that we had to consider what his words meant. Okay, so then his renunciation would fall under what we call co uh, natural law. According to the natural law, did he signify that he renounced the office? Now you you can understand that uh, renouncing the office as a concept is um, um, a, a specific word. In English, we're more likely to say he resigned from office. We rarely say he renounced his office. Some people understand what the word renounce is. So let me explain that. So in Latin, there's a verb renunciare, from which we get our English word renounce. And in Latin, there's a word resignare, from which we get our English word resign. Thanks be to God, because of the monks of old of, of the British Isles, we have both verbs, and they both mean what the Latin means. In Italian, that's not the case, and in, many, in modern language, it's not the case. In Italian, for example, they don't have um, uh, the word resign, an office. They say dimetere. They mean lay down the office, uh, lay it down. Dimetere in Latin means take something and put it down on the table, that it's no longer yours, to give it up as it were. And to, and when they say resignation, they said he did his demissione, meaning he did his laying downs. Um, they have another word for leaving office, as a violent one, sfinistri, means to be thrown out of the window, but that's different here. So um, English, we have it, Latin they don't. And in fact, this is one of the core problems, because the magisterial teaching on papal renunciations is from Pope Boniface VIII. You can find it at uh, fromom.info, just look up Boniface the Eighth, and um, I think one, I'm one of the few individuals who ever translated his rescript from Latin into English, and uh, I published my translation there. Uh, Pope Boniface uh, the Eighth, in his rescript, was discussing what um, um, Celestine V, when he resigned in the 14th century, was discussing with his cardinals: Can a pope resign? And the question was, can he renounce his office? Can he renounce his dignity? Can he renounce his duties? Things, those are the questions. And Boniface recorded that the decision was, by Celestine V, that a pope can resign. He used it, he didn't, the question was renounce, but he answered it, resign. And um, this is a very important point. And I don't think even canonists understand that because they're not experts in Latin, nor are they experts in philosophy, nor they know their etymologies. They just read the code and that's all they know. And this is one of the problems a lot of lawyers have. All they know is the law. <laughs> they don't know anything else. And um, it makes it dangerous to having a degree in law if you don't have a degree in something else. So here, let me describe. So renunciar, obviously, uh, from the Latin, renounce, has a re, and announce. And nounce, as you might know from the English word announce, or Latin annunciare, means to um, un to proclaim, to proclaim news. The nuncio, the apostolic nuncio, is the one who announces the will of the Pope in that country. And uh, renunciare, R-E, it comes from the Latin um, uh, retro, meaning to do something backwards. Or it could also mean to do it again or to do it backwards. And this is why renounce and resign both have the re in front of them. Because if you're going to give up your office, you have to undo what you did when you accepted the office. So when you accept the office, you take it to yourself. But when you renounce it or resign it, you separate it from yourself. Now, if a, a renunciation was merely a separation, because if we look at the word separation in this context, separation would be like the generic concept and the specific con specific examples of what that could be could be a renunciation or a resignation. Um, uh, Boniface VIII wrote the Latin word resignation, resignare, because 
the Latin word resignare means to take your seal off the document. See, in the Middle Ages, you didn't sign with a pen and ink. You took your seal, you, you uh, put some red wax on the document that was semi-molten, you put your seal onto that red wax, and you left your seal in that red wax, and that was a sign that U.S. Pope had approved that document. You had signed, you didn't sign it, you, you put your signum on it. But this is where we get our English word sign. I sign the document, comes from the Latin resigna, signare, meaning put, to put your seal on it. No one uses seals anymore, except maybe the Chinese in artwork to do their signature in red, in red ink. Uh, so he uses the word resignare because the popes in those days didn't sign, they sealed. And if you're going to give up the papacy, you had to, as it were, take your seal off the document where you said, I accept. It was a metaphor because obviously the popes, when they were elected, didn't put their seal on a document saying, I accept my election. It was just a metaphor. And in his Latin rescript, the word resignare was used. In about the 16th century, no one in Italy was using resignare anymore in most of Western Europe, and they thought it was an error of transcription, so they changed it to renunciare, and it ended up in the Code of 1917 as uh, if a pope renounces, and in the, the Code of 1983, it was if a pope renounces his munis, okay? And they use the verb renounce. So when you change a word, you change a meaning. I mean, it's obvious that renounce, though it's like resign, because they both start with R-E, uh, is uh, perhaps a different verb, and it is a different verb, because nounce, as I said, has to do with a proclamation, whereas resigning has to do with taking a seal off a document. Renouncing has to, is an announcement that takes back what you, you announced. It undoes your announcement, okay? And these are two different, uh, two different things. One of the fundamental things about language, which is not taught in elementary, middle school, or high school, even at universities, you have to only at higher levels of studies, is that all words are uh, pictogrammic in the sense of the real meaning of the word you're using is based on an idea that could be, that an ideogram, something that could have once been expressed with a drawing or artwork. Okay. The Chinese still do this with their characters, little ideogram, uh, they're kind of like pictographs, ideographs. And so the idea behind the word is what governs it, okay? So it, we have resign, which is taking your seal off the document, and we have renounce, which is taking back your announcement. There are two different uh, things. Obviously, when you resign uh, and you take your seal off the document, if there's no seal, you're using that word metaphorically, okay? And since you're using it metaphorically, it could mean anything because it's only a metaphor. But renounce is not that way. When you renounce, you're announcing backwards what you do. And since the verb announce requires a verbal expression, a renunciation must be a verbal text. It must be spoken or it must be written. So um, how do we know that a pope renounces? He has to actually say something. He can't just separate. And this is one of the fundamental misunderstandings of Pope Benedict's renunciation. People said, but he no longer acts as Pope. He went through all the, the formalities of giving up the papacy. He got in a helicopter. He flew away. He lives in a little house. He, he doesn't say Mass at St. Peter's. He doesn't uh, run the College of Cardinals. He doesn't run the Curie. He doesn't do any of that. He gave it all up and therefore he's renounced. Well, the, uh, the uh, that argument would be valid if we were asking, did he separate himself from the office? Because separation doesn't require a verbal act. It could be by gestures, okay? And, um, but unfortunately for those who sustain that argument, canon law says a pope must renounce. It doesn't say, a, if it happens, a pope separates himself from the office or stops acting like a pope. And this is just common sense too. Because what if some pope in some future or past time got so senile, he, uh, and if you've ever taken care of someone who suffers from senility or uh, dementia, uh, as I have, they'll start saying the most bizarre things, even the things that the opposite of what they intend to stay. Instead of saying, I want to go to church, they'll say, I don't want to go to church. Because uh, their mind start, stops functioning correctly, not their mind, but their brain stops functioning correctly, and they can't express themselves. 
And um, the church has been around 2,000 years, so the church knows how to avoid these kinds of problems. Uh, and therefore, it must be absolutely clear that the Pope wants to give up his office, and that has to be verbal, and it has to, has to be something that we can understand. It can't be through action. So if the Pope gets up one day <clears throat> and starts dressing as Donald Trump, that doesn't mean he's become Donald Trump or he's given up the papacy. It just means he's probably a little off, okay? <laughs> So these is the common sense laws for understanding when a pope renounces. And that's enough for this episode. Our next episode, we'll discuss um, what Benedict actually did and as a historic fact. And in the episode after that, we'll, we'll discuss uh, um, what it, he had to do to give up the office. I'm Brother Alexis Bagnolo. This is From Rome Info Video. Please subscribe to this channel so that uh, pretty soon I can do live transmissions. God bless.